sense. And I like to have a different, totally two different types of firms with different types of customers in different types of markets. So one of the firms is a telecommunication, the usual, you know, kind of phone that you have, this is in the Middle East. The company runs constantly a lot of A-B tests, so that was a good one actually to help me to just get this data out there that I can explore my question. The second one was uh, professional membership. Think about um, informs. You know, they have a bunch of people. This is, this is a membership setting. So in these two cases, there is this kind of contractual aspect of the relationship. And I'm gonna discuss at the end what, how I think about the non-contractual with the later attrition. So in this case, this data I had, they are like, you do observe when customers cancel. So in both cases, what do they have in common is the usual setup of retention campaigns in firms. Across both cases, what I have is a focal firm wanting to run a retention experiment or retention intervention and usual standard notation, so they observe a lot of things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play as what they see, what they do, how they do it, and I'm gonna try to really ex investigate the high risk versus the high sensitivity question there. So the first firm, the telco, observes the usual suspects like all this past behavior in terms of volume of data, volume of calls, international calls, etc. And the professional membership had a little bit more about information of the consumer, like how long has been the relationship with them, and a little bit of location data that I could use as my covariates. In both cases, there is an incentive to stay fully randomized. And uh, what I do is I observe for this paper, I looked at renewal decision a month after the intervention, because in both cases they have a monthly kind of relationship. Now, uh, I did not observe here longer, the customers for longer. Uh, therefore, I cannot give you empirics on the long-term effects, but I can give you my thoughts on how I thought about it and actually how we can think about some findings that relate li directly to the churn implement, uh, context. So this is what I did with the data. So a firm gives me the, the fully randomized experiment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split those in just two buckets. The first bucket, I'm gonna use it to play the best model I can to figure out what is your propensity to churn. And the other one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a causal random forest to actually estimate your kind of, in, the, in this case, I was use the uplift random forest to estimate your lift. So pretty much I want individual level estimates for one of these two. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I just did a, I mean, I did a bunch of cross validation to check which one was giving me the best, the most accurate version of it. And I took that to the second set of data set that I haven't used at all. And now in that, there what I do is I just, for each person, I predict their risk and their lift. So now I have the perfect just kind of, just information in front of me to really compare these two. Now, how I go about comparing that, I could, you could find, you could suggest better ways to do that. This is the way I did it, and I would like to hear more um, of if you think that there would be a better way to look at this question. So what I did is I took this data, the first I do is I just sort customers by their risk of churning, and or I sort customers on their lift, right? As the firm would do, and as, a, as we would do, <laughs> pretty much. Then when I look at the ones you're sorted by the risk, what I'm gonna do is I'm just splitting 10 groups. I compute the deciles, such that I can back at people, the high risk, the second highest risk, eight, seven, et cetera. And alternatively, of course, I will do the same for the high lift. I'm just sorting people on my expectations on either how they will, they will be churning or not, or how they will respond or not. Now that I have these deciles, what I'm gonna do is I'm computing just the treatment effect. I, know who you are in which bucket you are, and because it was, the experiment was fully randomized, I totally have treatment and control in every single bucket. So I'm gonna just count. I'm gonna look at the churn rate in the first group, among treated people, among control people, and I'm gonna just, just see what happens. So uh, I do this kind of a thousand times, so I can then have always that in the value. Then I can take the point estimate, the point difference, and then I can have some measure of uncertainty about it. So this is the first thing I'm gonna show you is churn rates when I sort customers on the level of risk. I mean, this, this uh, line here going down means that my churn model was pretty good. <laughs> That's all it says because the people who are on the left, these people here are those who are predicted to be at the highest risk of churning. So I look at churn rates and they're on the 90s. Okay, that makes sense. And as I go to the, to the right, then their churn rates decrease. Fine, my churn model was not a bad one. Now, 
the key here is that the question was, are the high-risk customers those who have the highest sensitivity to the intervention? So what I really want is, is this difference between churn rate among control people and churn rate among treated people, is this difference high or not? So if you look across the highest risk people, indeed you reduce churn here, half a 2% roughly, versus at the very end of the spectrum is actually the opposite. So you could think, oh, they're not doing a bad thing because if you think about it, the question was are higher risk people those who are more sensitive, it seems to be that I'm, when I intervene in these guys, I'm saving more customers than if I interview later. Now, of course, the question is, what is your baseline? So let, let me compare the same approach when I sort customers by their expected treatment effect instead of the expected risk, which we know that that should be the way to go, right? So if I put, the, if I turn it off and on, so if I now sort people, now of course, and now I, I I mean, I'm grouping people in the different criteria. Now I'm the ones here. The ones uh, here. The ones here are those who suspected treatment effect is the highest. And now we can see that actually the reduction in churn is way, way higher. So now I'm, I'm not reducing churn by two percent. I'm reducing churn by I think it's an eight percent. So this is one observation. The second observation is. The firm was expecting, if you ask them, I found the people who are going to be most sensitive to the intervention, what they would expect is that these people had a very high churn rate. And indeed, what I'm finding in this example is they're not. I'm not saying that those with half percent, like 50% risk, are going to be there, but this is a combination of people with all sorts of different risks. Right? Yeah? So what I'm going to do in the next slide, I just, I'm putting the treatment effect of... Uh, the red line is going to be always about the risk details when you sort customers on the base of risk. And the blue is going to be when you sort customers on the base of lift. So definitely in this conference, it doesn't come at a surprise at all that we have this line here because the high treatment effect people have a high treatment effect. Duh. Now, what is interesting was to see actually how suboptimal this strategy was. How suboptimal, how, how you are not really reducing churn if you were after the people at the highest risk of churning. Yep. Quick question. Yes. On the previous slide, so you gave people money and you caused them to churn yeah. more on the right? Yeah. Like, do you have a logical explanation? This usually. I don't know if it's really logical. I know. So the thing is, so, the, uh, yeah. And so I have, a, I have a previous paper that in which actually we found the same thing. And we quantified the amount of people in which we kind of pushed away. And uh, even giving them money, it was giving them some highlights. So in the previous example, what the company, the way they rationalized it was that we encouraged them to look at competitive offers. Because this is a very mature, it's not that they stop using the cell phone. I don't, so this is that mature market that if they churn, they're going to the competitor. Now, we don't know where they go because we don't have the number to participate. But so there, um, I'm not, I wasn't surprised to find an uh, increasing churn results because uh, I also had seen it in different totally markets, push them away, just remind them, them to search for something. But I don't have a better uh, logical mechanism. Yep. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, like, was, it was really like, so using the same paradigm, what I'm gonna do is giving you a few add-ons of how to look at this data to better help the manager understanding how wrong is what they're doing. And what I did is I just look at three things, one is, Generally in this industry, when they don't do the, the, the experimentation before, what they do is they have a budget, and then do you target people until you hit that budget? And uh, what they do is, okay, why don't go to the top 10 decile, the 10 decile, the top 10 people at higher risk of top 20? So what I did is I took my treatment effects, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a accumulated effect if I just keep like, if I target the top 10 people, this is, uh, this is here, this is, oh, where am I? Here. If I target the top 10% customers of the highest risk, I was getting the treatment effect before. What if I target the top 20, the top 30, top 40? Pretty much is the accumulation of the previous treatment effect. Here was the idea to quantify to the, to the manager how bad they are doing by keeping this policy. It was just more a quantification that had some managerial relevance. Now, the question is, why is this really that different? 
the very easy answer is like, well, because these customers are not the same. So one way to quantify that is like, can I give any sense of correlation between inherent risk or underlying risk and underlying treatment effect? And what I was looking at, I cannot give you a correlation per se, because I'm, I'm not really making assumptions of how you know, these things are distributed or anything. But what I did was, okay, if I take, I can look at the overlap of customers. What I can look at is, if I take the top risk decile, if how percentage of top lift, top lift people are in that design? Now, if, I, if that was perfect, what I should find is something like this, because I can hit 100% very quickly, and then it's going to give me just a sense of correlation. So in this example, risk and lift were very light, slightly correlated, slightly positive correlated, because you can see that I can go a little bit higher. The second thing we did was, well, is there anything about the characteristics of the consumers that can help me understand why these guys are so different? And the idea here is like, I'm gonna just dig, I'm gonna go back to the covariates I observe. I cannot make generalizable points at this point because this was one example. I have two examples. I'm working on having something bigger. What I looked at is, look, I'm gonna look at each customer characteristic that I observe. For example, here, if you look at the second one, it says, there is no recharge, meaning the moment of the intervention, I look at how, how was, when was the last time that you put extra money in your account, right? This is a very, very good predictor for risk. If you look at the red line, this is the high risk, the low risk. Well, the high risk people, it's long time since they didn't recharge. So what this exercise was helping me understanding what would be the characteristics that actually are good predictors for risk and not to live, so the manager can think about better experimentation, better, better implementation of these programs. Now, this is one of the examples I did. Very quickly, I'm gonna go you to the second one just to show that it was not a coincidence. And I had three examples, three examples originally, but these two were enough for the evidence, so that's, I stopped there. So the second one is a very total context. It's a subscription. In this case, sample size is way smaller. These people cannot experiment a lot because in this case, in fact, these 2,100 people are all the ones who were up for renewal at a certain time when they wanted to run. So it's really that they cannot really sample. And then, so this is context in which it gets more difficult, but they did that, they did a full randomization. In this case, the incentive, it was not monetary incentive. It was more a thank you, kind of a try to show the customer it's a valued customer or whatnot. You will see how in this case actually this one really backfired, but this one has a very logical reason. So here I just jump into the results directly. So on the blue line we have the treatment effect when you sort customers by lift. Again, this monotonic decreasing is what we would expect. Now, what happened when we actually target customers on the risk? Now, as I said, here I had fewer customers and definitely I have way more noise in my estimates here. But it was, so what happened here is that if you go after the people at the higher risk, you're killing people. That's pretty much what you're doing. Now, in this case, what happened that, of course, they didn't anticipate, once we were looking at what were the characteristics, that I'm gonna show you in a second, one of the characteristics that was super, uh, super predictive of risk and super predictive of lift was tenure with the organization. So the first year members, had a very high risk of churning and had a very, very low treatment effect, as low as it was very negative. If you send me a letter saying, thank you very much for being a valuable customer, and I've been around for a year, and most likely haven't been that active, that's pretty much what they were doing, they were pushing away. But of course, not a, not a priority they thought about that, but this is actually something that came up. So in this case, this is the very bad relationship uh, between risk and lift. When I looked at the accumulation of the impact of the campaign, as you see here, the bars are wider because, you know, but so actually, definitely the, the, the treatment was started being very negative because actually they, were, they would have been hitting the people for whom the intervention was actually the worst. Uh, in this case, the overlap is indeed negative for the reason that I just mentioned. And you, we found this digging deeper into the activities, the, why you have very different overlap between customers at a high risk versus and customers at a high risk lift. So here, the, the one of the most telling one is the one here. If you just put a dummy for whether you're in the first year, 
look at how well predictive is for risk. So you are in this space, you are very high risk, and you are first year versus not, and how the treatment effect heterogeneity moves along this line, which is really saying that it actually was the opposite. Okay? So in these two cases, the whole idea was to, sh to actually investigate whether the high risk and the high lift had some consistent or systematic positive correlation. The answer is no in here. And what I started doing after finishing this project was looking at, well, we here we're talking about the risk of subscribe, unsubscribing right now. The intervention happened right now, and my outcome is happening right now, right? But the question is, the firm really does not on, only care about whether you're or not. They want to have active customers today, but definitely what they want is they, they want long-time customers. And it's been a lot of recurrent conversation in the conference about the short term and the long term. So I'm going to give you some analytical results that I got from this paper and then how I'm thinking about it moving forward. So in marketing, many of you have used some sort of customer lifetime value metric, CLV. The whole idea is that I'm going to not care just today. I care about my customer tomorrow the day after. I'm going to look at those, those string of cash flows, and I'm going to discount it to today. Now, because I lose customers on the way, I'm going to apply some retention rate on the way. It's as simple as that. Now, in this particular context, it was the telco context. What I did was, well, let me start thinking about, is it that I change the retention rate today? so you were more prone to renew after the, in the intervention? Or is it that I actually then, you actually keep being more prone to renew later? My hypothesis is that if you only gave me some incentive, short-term incentive to do something today, and you are not really changing any feature, anything about the service, these retention rates of the future are not gonna be really affected by it, right? So what I was doing is like, okay, what I've been saying so far is like firms go after, some firms go after high-risk customers and they shouldn't. Now, what if firms really wanted to maximize something like this calculation here, which is the customer lifetime value? If you want to really maximize not just today's revenue, but tomorrow and the day after. So the notation I use here is the lambda is going to be using for some profitability for period, and the retention rate is really like whether you're near or not. All the analysis I've done has been about just retention rate. I look at the retention rate right after the intervention, and what I showed you is that the increase or decrease in retention rate because of the intervention has nothing to do with how risky you were of dying. That's what I showed thus far. Now, the question is, if the firm really cares about this problem, of course this is what they, they should be maximizing delta CLV, not delta retention rate, right? But how do we think about that? We don't have good models to actually, I, I don't have good data to actually understand the retention rates in month two, three, six, et cetera. I'm collecting that, but I didn't have that at the time. So what I did was, well, what if I start making some assumptions and analytically think about how this maximization would change thinking about the future? So I started with the most simplest approach, which is, look, you only gave me a quick incentive to renew today. So I'm going to assume that all the effect I found in this is purely short term. It really changes how likely I was this month to renew. But then the next month, I'm going to go back to my kind of my steady retention rate, whatever number that is, right? Under that assumption, if the firm is really wanting to maximize customer lifetime value, you can take some derivative, and under some assumptions of assuming the profitability being stable, you get to the firm if really, really cares about long-term value and assuming in this particular context that the intervention was short-term retention, you can simplify that expression here in something that looks this way. And what this is is, forget about that this is just on discount rate of money, doesn't matter in this case. What you have here on the right-hand side here is the probability of churning if you are not treated versus churning if you treat it. This is the treatment effect. This is the change in renewal rates today because of the intervention. Now, what you have here in the denominator is the probability that you churn when you are not treated, which is pretty much just your churn risk. How, ris how likely are you to churn, right? Now, there is two negatives, and it's in the denominator. What it means that if this firm runs a campaign that only has short-term effect on retention rates, and the firm really cares about the long 
term value of the customer and delta of that, they should indeed target customers with the lowest churn rate. And the logic there is that if you really care about not today's revenues, but also the day after and the day after, there is a geometric process there in which people keep renewing or not. So to maximize this delta on CLV, the people who maximize those delta actually are those with high retention rates, therefore low turn rates. So in this case, if actually you run a short-term campaign, willingness or not, a campaign that actually is not gonna have a long-term impact on your customer behavior, not only what they were doing doesn't make any sense because they're not correlated, actually what you were doing was especially wrong because you are not maximizing the delta. Again, this is only purely analytical with the strong assumptions. I don't have the data backing up that this effect was purely short term, even though I believe it was. So on this, I want to just finish with a couple of uh, thoughts from uh, this work. Uh, first of all, that, I mean, I, and, and again, I said this is not for the people who generally come to this conference, but there is a whole world out there who don't run so much experiments as, as you do, and who think about things different ways, so I think this is good, a good kind of analysis, empirical analysis, to show them that they should actually refocus some of the things they do and they think about. I think there is a lot of room for, I know this conference has been talking about heterogeneous treatment effects for years, uh, there is a lot of room for at least marketers or people in marketing departments to learn more from the heterogeneity to actually make inferences about consumer behavior in general. And now, some thoughts about the short-term and long-term effects. What I did here and what I told you about is a purely contractual setting in which customers will renew now, they will renew next month, et cetera. So I can have some, I can play with that formula and I can understand the effects. Now, in the majority of cases we're talking about, say, a retail, they don't have this contractual relationship and what you care about is that if you treat the customer today and say he buys today, uh, you wanna know what is gonna be the, in a month, in two months later, what is gonna be kind of the, the residual value of the consumer. And in this case, you face like something like these cases of latent attrition that you're not gonna see if the customer comes back or not, but there is a way to think about it. Now, what, uh, what, what, I, what I'm working on and what I want to work more on is like, we have several retention models, behave, kind of behaviorally based somehow retention models. And the whole idea is that how can I actually adjust those to learn about how to learn about the future. And, um, and I think there is room, at least for marketers, to really understand uh, not only how to implement these models that you're already doing, but how actually we could use our existing theoretical-based models for retention and why customers buy or not and why customers are retained or not to actually implement some of these and have some learnings that could be more generalizable. So with that, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, next up, I, I think we decided we wanted to finish off the conference with something really simple. Uh, so uh, <laughs> Jessica is going to, uh, from Berkeley, is going to talk about transfer learning. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll try to keep you awake. So I guess, I guess we do, we are at the point now that neural networks are entertaining and people will stay awake for them. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about transfer learning. Uh, uh, using neural nets to estimate causal effects. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Soren Kunzel, who's a student of mine uh, at Berkeley, uh, and with Bradley Staddy, uh, who used to be a Berkeley graduate student, is currently a postdoc at Vector uh, in Toronto. Two Berkeley undergrads, Nikita and Varsha, and a colleague of mine, Peter Abiel, who's a prominent uh, roboticist. All right, so when people start doing uh, neural networks, they think they're gonna have, their life is gonna be like this. They're gonna have millions of pictures of cats, and they wanna make a cat classifier. They think they're gonna have these beautiful cat pictures, millions of them. They think they're gonna get this massive supercomputer. They think they're gonna get LBL to let them use their computer to uh, classify cats. And then they're gonna train the model, and it's gonna do great in cat classification. It's gonna be awesome. What actually happens is you have some pictures of cats, a small to medium uh, amount, uh, and then you got a bunch of other pictures that might be related. There are tigers, there are cheetahs, 
you know, that's kind of like cats, kind of not like cats, but Google's worked that image data set up for you, so maybe you want to try to use it, and you need to let, let it run on your laptop. So that's going to be way less fun, right? So you might want to like try to find a smarter way to use the data in the computing so you don't have to brute uh, uh, force uh, everything. And you know, underlying this are a bunch of issues that, may, that naturally uh, give rise to transfer learning. One is data is expensive. Uh, you know, maybe not cat pictures, given that everyone posts them for free online, but most data sources that are of interest uh, to people here, their expense, data is expensive, especially relative to the size of the effects we're interested in. And in those domains where we have vast amounts of data, like billions of observations, I could like crank through RCTs, the uh, true effects are, 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 are tiny, so the data is still expensive. I still have, a, because of the terrible signal to noise ratio, I still don't have enough data for many tasks. Uh, for tasks where I have large treatment effects, say in clinical medicine, uh, and the treatment effects are quite powerful, I usually do not have billions of observations. So data is expensive. Computing is expensive, especially in the world of neural networks. I gotta like go to hyperparameters, I gotta go this and that, and now it like takes weeks to optimize. Uh, and that's uh, uh, somewhat expensive. Uh, and also, like more importantly, like when you train these things from scratch, it just like kind of feels wrong. You know, if you're a kind of person that keeps running experiments all the time, and you have like a new experiment, and you want to go estimate, like say, the average human effect or treatment effect heterogeneity, it's it seems wrong to just ignore all the previous experiments you've ever run. That seems like uh, less than ideal. Uh, and then, and there's a last reason I want to talk about a little bit that for this audience may not, may not be as intuitive is that transfer learning uh, can act as a powerful regularizer for neural nets, right? So for what we mean by transfer learning is, you know, like in the CAD example, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take what I've learned about like cheetahs and lions, right? And I wanna use that information to help me classify cats, right? So I'm transferring from one domain to another. And then from a usual statistical point of view, that's like, oh yeah, I'm adding data, that's, that's good. Uh, maybe it's a shrinkage estimator too, right? If I have some previous experiment, you know, I'm gonna shrink to that, and if I'm gonna move away from that experiment by the new data, I'll let it, but I'll update. So that it's phrased that way, it's like a prior and posterior uh, kind of thing. Uh, those are all sensible things. Uh, in, an, in neural network land, you have, an, you have an additional need for regularization. These are massively over-parameterized models, right? One way of thinking about it is to get the universal approximation results for neural networks, you only need one layer. I can't remember the last time for any prominent architecture anyone had a one layer neural network, right? So that violates, you know, our information theory laws of universal approximation. Why is that? Yeah, you know, one layer is enough to universally approximate an arbitrary function of a certain class, but we can't find that result. We can't, like stochastic gradient descent and our initializations are terrible, we can't find that solution. So it turns out we use much larger networks uh, than we need to, like in that information theory sense, because we can't find uh, a solution that's there. So we use massively over-parameterized networks. We like those networks not to be sensitive to starting values. So this absurdity arises that, bi that you often find that a larger network is less sensitive to starting values than a smaller network. Because part of what happens is just by chance, some neurons get turned on. Right? And in a large network, there are enough of them get turned on in your original initialization such that you have a good result. For a smaller network, that doesn't quite uh, happen. So you have these massively over-parameterized uh, models. So you need to regularize them somehow. In the usual cases like image classification, the way that regularization ends up occurring is you have tons of data uh, for training, you have tons of data for validation, and you have a prediction problem. And prediction problems are easy, um, to, to, to check and constrain, because you know whether it's a cat picture or not. You know it's, you know it's labeled, it's supervised. Causal inference is not like that. I don't know what the treatment effect is for any individual. I don't care if I have a billion observations, I don't know what the treatment effect for a single individual is. That has to be estimated. So when I set up this training validation loop, it doesn't constrain my training the way a pure prediction problem does, right? So I need extra, forms of regularization. So transfer learning is of particular importance when I'm trying to do things like that. That's why it's very prominent in robotics, and I think it plays an interesting role uh, for treatment effect estimation. And the bottom line of that kind of reasoning is even if all you care about is, is optimizing for a given task, getting a neural architecture that works well for five different tasks probably makes this generalization error less for the task you care about, because you're acting as a form of regularization 
uh, for, uh, so it's not like overfitting, uh, which, you know, they like doing, right? So transfer learning is very common. It's not, not new uh, in, uh, in, in, in the neural net community. It happens a lot in computer vision. It happens a lot in GANs, variational autoencoders, a reinforcement learning, robotics, natural language processing, and hyperparameter tuning. It's like it's become a thing. It's a, lot, it's a very active uh, uh, literature in various ways. Hasn't really been used for like the kinds of problems of interest uh, to this audience, right? And neural networks naturally uh, lend themselves for transfer learning. They naturally lend themselves to the task of, hey, I, I have like a five different tasks. I've, I've run this kind of model on a previous task. Let me help, you know, adapt it to a new task and adapt it in some way instead of starting from scratch. And partly, as, as we'll see in a few slides, it's very easy to make layers that are shared. Like, it's very easy to say, well, this component of the model is shared across the five tasks I care about. Or say I've done experiments in five different countries. These layers are shared across those five countries. One of the data examples we're going to have, you know, these layers are shared across these 10 states. And these other layers are not. These other layers are quite separate. They're like state specific or country specific or they're gender specific or they're subgroup specific. So it's very easy to do that with the architecture. Uh, they can be retrained arbitrarily. You can literally just say, oh, this is a trained model that someone has given me, and I'm going to let it iterate a little more, right? Because it's a derivative-based optimizer, it's really terrible derivatives, it's stochastic gradient descent, uh, but, which is itself a form of regularization. Uh, but you can let it iterate some more, and it becomes very natural to do that. Like compare that, to say, with like random forests, which I've uh, given talks here uh, before, you know, if I have a random forest model that was done on one experiment and that data and I'm really happy with it and now I have a new experiment, it's a little unclear how I, like, like iterate it to the new experiment, like initialize it from my previous one and iterate. Do I, like, keep my trees frozen, the 500, say, I got from the previous experiment and I add a few more? Well, how many more do I add? It becomes a very, uh, it's not a very natural thing to update something like a uh, random forest, right? So, which then leads to the obvious thing, like the first thing someone thinks about when they think about this problem is, oh yeah, what I'll do is, so I have five different experiments, you know, for experiment one, you know, so that, that, that one you did first, I'll train a neural network uh, to give me some treatment effect estimates, and then for experiment two, I'll take those as initializations and I'll iterate just a little bit. That's called fine tuning. Maybe I'll take one or two steps. Right? It's not a bad idea. It, in practice, it rarely works well at all. Um, partly because if you think about it, well, how many steps do you take? You know, if you're allowed to take as many steps as you want, then you know, did the initialization really matter? You've got to be a little more clever uh, than that. And then there's been lots of literature um, in reinforcement learning in particular, but other domains that this fine tuning doesn't really work uh, so well. You've got to be a little more uh, clever than that. So here's like the lay of the land, like in transfer learning. Uh, probably forgotten something. Don't get, me mad, don't get mad at me if I have, right? So like they analytically break into part in pretty reasonable ways. Like one way is to say it's meta, a meta learning, meta networks, which is, all right, so some things I want to learn, uh, they're, they're going to be stable across many tasks, i.e., I'm going to go off and run experiments in five different states over time. And there's going to be some features of the problem that are going to be stable over those states and time periods, right? And that's going to be one set. And there's other things that are going to be much more local that really move around depending on what year I do the experiment and what state it is, something particular about Massachusetts that's different from New Jersey, so on and so forth, right? So what you end up is these set of algorithms to set up different learning rates for the things that you want to learn. The, more slowly that are more stable and things you want quick adaptations to. So we're going to use that idea in our framework and we're going to do it in a very particular way. Uh, Reptile is a very particular uh, implementation of that from OpenAI for how you do that updating, uh, which is kind of clever and works well. Uh, there's Mammal from well, one of our co-authors, uh, Peter, which is another way of trying to come up with this adaptive way of trying to learn some things I should learn fast, other things I should uh, learn slower. And you know, if I get those rates wrong, right? If I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a mess for myself, right? So the hard problem here becomes that I gotta learn the slow things, not too slow, but not too fast, and the fast things, not too fast, not too slow, and that becomes um, the central difficulty. Then there's a set of other ideas which are like, look, 
As these things learn, as neural networks learn, they will uh, forget things that they learned many epochs ago. Right? So you get these weird things as these things train, it literally, you know, you give them some loss functions, such as I want to like, minimize mean squared error of my estimate. As they go down through their training paths, what will off, which will occur, right, is that, oh, at some point they had a really good estimate for like women in Boston, right? And then later that estimate fell apart as they're minimizing overall mean squared error. Uh, and because on average they're doing better, but they forgot something about that subgroup, right? So you have a set of networks that say, let's not, no, you're not allowed to do that, right? There's certain things that you've learned once they're up to, up to a good point, I'm gonna freeze them, so it's gonna prevent uh, forgetting, right? And then there's these fun games that you can say that, look, I'm gonna do these stochastic gradient descent uh, to like minimize my loss function, but maybe I can do add a layer to that. I'm gonna do stochastic gradient descent on my stochastic gradient descent to figure out how quickly I should learn uh, for it to be transportable across different uh, uh, situations, different experiments in different locations. And we're gonna like take all of those ideas and we're gonna like combine them in various ways and I'm gonna try in this talk to give you some figures, try to give you some intuition. Of course, you know, the details are in the paper, right? So the motivating like data example uh, in the talk of the paper is we're trying to estimate the conditional average treatment effect, which is quite popular to estimate around here, right? Which is just the treatment effect conditional on some uh, covariates. And for the purposes of this paper, we assume those covariates are fixed over experiments, so those covariates don't change. Uh, those experiments you could imagine, I've, I have a whole bunch of experience, my covariates keep changing. Uh, that's an interesting problem, uh, an active area of research, but that's not our, our concern here. But what is a concern here is the what the meaning of the covariates does change, right? A motivating example is gonna be these mailers to try to encourage people to get out the vote. Uh, and we have an experiment of two million people, right? And, but, you know, some of our, but, but our covariates don't mean the same thing. In a sense, the one of our covariates is, you know, our outcome's gonna be, you know, did I get you to vote? One of our covariates is, did you vote last time? But in some states, in some elections, last time was a very competitive high saliency election say a Senate seat was up, you know, a governor's race was up, it was competitive in a presidential race. In other states, it was a very boring election, right? So, so the covariates in our problem are the same, but they don't mean the same thing in different contexts and time. So it has a little bit about that, but we're suppressing currently that the covariates could be all, all, all different, and that adds another layer. Uh, that would add another layer uh, to our machinery that we ignore, right? So, so the thing about, I'm gonna emphasize again, because causal inference you know, ha, involves these unobservables, right? For every unit, I don't observe your status in treatment and control, I only observe one of the two. Training is quite difficult. And, and it's true for all estimators, it's true for random forest, it's true for neural nets, because if I split my data into training and validation and I have some estimate and I get predictions for every individual, I can't just look at my validation set and just calculate a mean squared error to see how right you were, because for every individual, I don't know what their treatment effect was. I don't observe it, right? It's not plaster in your head, right? So partly because of that, when you use any of these complicated things to estimate causal effects, you need, uh, you need lots of data, and, and it becomes a difficult uh, thing. So often people have a lot of ancillary data, we wanna use it. Uh, There's another way of just saying, I think transfer learning is important in general uh, for these uh, networks. I think it's particularly important uh, in the causal inference uh, space, right? So we're gonna just do it in these data sets. Our X's are gonna be the same, their meanings uh, change. As far as I know, we're the first paper to like, do this. It's not really a thing that someone's thought hard about. All right, to try to give some intuition for what's happening in this very complicated machinery, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, the simplest network. This one doesn't work well. This is not a good idea to do, uh, but we'll start with it, right? So say we have two experiments, experiment zero and experiment one, uh, and then you have some X covariates, and uh, you have X covariates for treatment and control, and the way it's set up is just set up with two layers. There are two conceptual layers. You get as many layers as you want, but there's two conceptual layers. And for experiment uh, zero, you run it, you try to estimate it in these two layers, and it needs to output your potential, your estimates of potential outcome under control, which is mu sub zero, uh, and potential outcomes under treatment, which is mu sub one. Uh, so the subscripts denote uh, the potential outcomes, the superscripts denote experiment zero, and you have some loss function, right? Same mean squared error. Uh, and you do it, and you just run that network, right? And then what you do is then you take it, you take its resulting weights, 
and you use them as starting values for experiment two. Right, so that's why it's called warm start. I don't initialize it at random, I initialize it with a, with a, with a warm start uh, for where uh, I began. And I can't emphasize enough that how you initialize these networks are like a huge, huge thing, right? To give you an, an idea of this is a recent paper I call the lottery problem in these networks, that if I train a neural network, and at the end of it, uh, I, I decide where I am, right? And then I just look at, in terms of which of the weights are non-zero, if I go back to the original, if I go back now to the original network and just delete all the nodes uh, that ended up being at zero to be, uh, at the end and just reinitialize, I do better. I train faster and I get a slight improvement in mean squared error, which is like how incredibly sensitive these things uh, are to, initial, uh, uh, to initialization. Um, but so this could help in that case. In our experience, it doesn't really uh, help much, right? Okay, the first thing that's actually helpful is the second easiest thing you can think of is called frozen features. And this one has a very intuitive feel to it. I still have two experiments, right? And I'm still gonna try to learn across both of them. But now what I say is I have these two layers. You know, generally any of these can be decomposed into 10 layers each if, if you wish. My first layer I'm gonna say, I'm gonna read as those are things that are common features across the experiments, right? I don't observe these features. These are gonna be latent embeddings, but these are the common things. So the network's gonna take in and in the first layer, it's going to do transformations. And I'm going to enforce that those layers are frozen across the two experiments, right? That these features are frozen, hence the name frozen feature, right? And then I'm going to have the second layer that gets to be just experiment specific. And I backprop over the whole thing. So, you know, what the idea would be, you know, I take a batch of data. It has to be from experiment one or two. Uh, I, I backprop the whole thing. And then I go to this experiment, the second, I get to it, the next batch of data comes to the second experiment, and the first layer thing is going to now be uh, frozen here. So when I backprop, I only backprop the second layer, not the whole thing, right? The defect here is the first, the first experiment zero has got to be more important, right? I fix the features from there. When I go to experiment two, I don't let it update the base layer. Right, and, and this can make sense. Maybe experiment zero had a million observations. Experiment one has like 50,000, and maybe you don't want it to touch the base layer then, right? So you really believe the first one much more, right? You can uh, initialize, you can like generalize this slightly to like uh, what something that works better uh, in general, which is called multi-head, which is kind of the same idea as before, but you don't like freeze like one of the layers just based on the first experiment. What you allow it is you have these two layers, oops, Sorry, I think I got to, uh, yeah, I have these two layers. Uh, and then I get a batch of data. I backprop the whole thing here. So I make updates to layer one and layer two. Then I get a second batch of data, which is going to be experiment two. And I backprop the whole thing. So it's going to make updates to layer one and layer two. And then I go back to experiment one in the next batch, and it gets to update both. So now they're joint, so the first layer is going to be shared in some sense, and then they both jointly get to optimize that, right? So if you don't really have a strong prior on which of the two experiments, you know, it's gonna be the most valid in terms of establishing the common features, right? That this is probably something like this is gonna be uh, the way to go, right? And what's gonna happen is when you can take this architecture, you can add to it uh, meta-learning, right? Which is like you want right in the learning to be know that you're gonna do these updates from these base layers. So the, so the argument that comes there is, oh, what you do is you take a draw of data, you're gonna decide where to do it and which arm you're gonna update, right? And you get to update, say, five epochs, you get a mean squared error, you back prop back. And then you take another draw, you get to update five draws. And then the whole thing is when you loop through, you delete your last five epoch updates. Right, so it's going to get a layer. It's going to get like a draw from a meta model, and it knows that it's going to get a local adaptation to get a prediction. So to even get a prediction from such a meta learner for any given step, it's going to know what I'm going to need to do, like say five iterations. Right, that's going to that's probably a little complicated. The intuition is going to be that the model's being trained and being taught that when this model makes a prediction, even for data it is seeing, it is going to need to update say five steps. Right? So it's built right into its training loop that it's going to do some local uh, updating. Right? If you combine that, 
With the meta learner thing, it seems to, uh, with the uh, multi-head thing, it seems to, uh, it works pretty well, All right? So in our data set uh, and our experiments here, we have like 17 experiments with, which have two million individuals. And it's uh, evaluating a mailer to get voters to turn out in the 2014 US election. All of the techniques we developed, were, these were developed in not using this data. We had a previous uh, large-scale experiment that was similar, but it was a different election. It wasn't a midterm election. It was an off-off-year election. It was a very low saliency election. It was in Michigan. It was, uh, uh, it was very, it was pretty, the, the situation was quite different, although the, the treatments were um, uh, the same. And the treatments here are the social sanction one. You send out a mailer and to say, hey, Jane, this is your voting history of uh, the last few elections. We're going to update this after the election. Please vote, Jane. Uh, in the US, whether you vote or not is public record. For whom you vote is not. So these things actually have quite a large uh, treatment effect. You know, it depends, maybe 4%, five, 5%. Four percent, five percent. They work. They kind of shock people. Uh, those are the uh, treatments here. Uh, campaigns, everyone really cares about the heterogeneity of the treatment effect here. Uh, for obvious reasons you can think about. <laughs> uh, and uh, the treatment effect is heterogeneous. There's even some evidence if you target the wrong people, there's a, little, there's a few people that react so negatively to the treatment that it might even uh, vote a little less, right? So you take that data, and uh, these aren't data results. These are we build off simulations off that data to be as close to the data as possible. Uh, and you get these results, which are probably going to be a little hard to read um, if you're not familiar with the background. So for the people who follow the literature heterogeneous treatment effects, the panel SNN is like, um, single learner, which is sort of like you just make the treatment, you pool treatment and control, you just make the, and you pool all the covariates, and you just make treatment a single covariate. Uh, TNN is you estimate treatment and control separately, and you just take a uh, difference of estimates, right? And our last thing here is this is the MLRW, is our meta learning model put on top uh, uh, of our neural architectures. Right, and these are the random forests. These are the sort of random forest models for that problem. Uh, and what you'll see is this is like number of data size steps that you need. Remember, in our experiment, we have like two million. The upside of that, the way we generate the simulations is we fit a model in the two million, uh, a random forest model, not even a neural net model, and we assume that's just the truth, and we just generate data from it. And then the question is, can a finite sample model pick it up and know here that the the, the random force models are the models that actually were used to generate the truth, and they do worse than the neural net model that does the uh, uh, transfer learning. Um, and then the key features you'll kind of learn is that, you know, if you do, you know, the black lines or the baselines, that most all of the, you know, the uh, transfer learning parts are going to do better than the ones who just try to estimate the models. Uh, uh, separately, and the one that works quite well is this one that right, the model is told it's going to be a transfer learning model. It is told it's going to have to make predictions elsewhere, right? So for every prediction it gets, it has to like iterate a few times, and that's built into uh, uh, the training step. And the last thing I'll say here is that these things are, um, you know, it, is that are quite complicated to work and difficult to work. The thing about like the usual statistical approaches would be like some kind of shrinkage estimator. I'm going to do some empirical Bayes or Bayesian uh, estimator to, to combine experiments, right? Those have natural theoretical guarantees in a sense that, you know, when I'm right, I'm going to gain some mean squared error advantage. When I'm wrong, asymptotically, I'm still going to be okay because the weight on the prior just goes away, right? These have no such uh, theoretical guarantees. In a sense that if you get the, if you don't have a good training validation cycle and you're not careful for how you set it up, it's going to take, it's unclear whether even infinite amount of data will make you undo the damage uh, that you've done. So it's not, it's not the kind of thing you would want to have in an automated pipeline if you didn't have a team that it could be skilled enough to evaluate these. While in contrast, say some empirical base techniques for how to combine various experiments, I might be far more comfortable putting in a pipeline because I have these theoretical guarantees and it's going to work. This is like, it's, it, the engineering challenge is quite high here, just like the nuance of judging whether the models have worked or not are quite high. You know, people have cre are, are creating like uh, neural nets on top of neural nets to try to do hyperparameter tuning, but they're still not that great. Uh, but the advantages when they do work are quite, uh, quite, quite strong.
Um, yeah, so we'll uh, in a second take some questions from the from the audience. And, and I, I guess I just wanted to first comment on I, I think um, the interesting way that this illustrated how this you know community is both helping uh, people doing applied work kind of catch up with what with what we've learned and, and understand uh, why that's happening, uh, and also kind of trying all these crazy things that we wouldn't dare actually recommend that some uh, uninformed. Uh, marketing agency try because, as you said, it could be worse than doing nothing. So I, I really think that's a great, uh, a great range. So I just wanted to start off with a, a question for you, Ava, which is um, uh, just thinking about these cases where, so there is this great intuition behind the idea of targeting people based on risk and that you might think it's some kind of an upper bound on, on your treatment effect. And um, I guess one of the things I noticed is that some of the churn rates in your experiments were really high. And so it's not that uh, even the people who are pretty far down into not being the most likely churners, they just have very high churn rates. So that upper bound doesn't seem like it's really going to be binding in a lot of cases. And so I wonder if you can sort of comment on, on how much you think, uh, how terrible that heuristic would do in other settings where uh, maybe that, that's a more binding upper bound where churn rates are relatively low. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I only investigated that uh, via simulations, because the both cases is kind of 50-50. And uh, if you think about uh, uh, Telco, for example, if you look at the very high-end type of plans, the turn rate would be way lower. Mm -hmm. I, what I believe there is, uh, I mean, you, you're not going to kill, so kill so many customers when turn rates are not that high, because there are a lot of safe customers. Now, in cases where the churn rate is very low, what I believe is we will have also more challenge to find heterogeneity in the treatment effect. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I think is that, so I don't think, um, so you're asking, would, if you have a very low churn rate, targeting people at the highest risk of churning is not gonna be as bad as you showed, right? If mm -hmm. I understand the question correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's not going to be as bad in the magnitude that I show because I give you in a context in which there was a lot of uh, right. people leaving. Right, both in this but, idea that it's not this binding upper bound and also that this argument you advance around CLV that if I were to somehow prevent these people from not churning this month, well, they're going to churn next month anyway. So Yeah, but, but even in the long term, the, the diff, small diff, if people have very high retention rates or very low churn rates, the slight difference in the churn rate today has a bigger impact in the future. Mm -hmm. Because these people will stay for longer. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, if you keep this yeah. retention rate constant. So I, I, I agree with you. I think here there were two good examples for me to kind of play with the heterogeneity versus the risk. Because there was a very good, like, uh, low, high risk of churning. Uh, I, I haven't showed this with data, but I still believe that that correlation is not necessarily there. Now, just let me finish with this. What I believe the correlation between high risk customer and high lift is going to be high is in contexts in which the reasons why people encourage that behavior are pretty homogeneous, and therefore the treatment, the incentive, can tackle those issues. So there are, I've seen data on direct marketing campaigns, which what they do is they have checked whether the person was more likely to respond just like a risk model has some, dif some relationship with the lift model. And some researchers in Chicago, they have found a stronger correlation than my results. And the reasons why they claim is because these direct marketing campaigns have been ma optimized for many, many years, and they really nailed why people were going to buy or not. But that's, uh, yeah. yeah, that's good to idea. Cool. So, and, and I think one of the big conclusions for me from that was just the huge value of even a little bit of experimentation uh, to help totally. you test some of that those assumptions. So, um, yeah, let's take a question from Ronnie. So, um, the one thing that, you know, first of all, I was surprised at how bad it did with some of the good people. But do you think it's possible that the intervention that you tested was just not a good one? So, for example. Um, insurance companies will say, well, you've been a loyal customer for three years. We're going to give you a 5% discount if you stay longer. Are, there are some interventions that seem to sort of directly encourage staying longer, whereas this one, you gave me some money. Wow, let me think about this. You know, really, am I spending so much with you? So, so 
is it possible that the two treatments that you proposed for these two experiments are just bad, and had we tried five of each, one of them might have been really good? Yes, that's back to the point that I said, if, if the intervention, so, so if, if you have an intervention that was amazing, right, uh, you really nailed the reason why somebody was not doing something. Because that, that, so think about it, you give me an incentive to stay with a company, if that campaign is amazing, it's because you nailed it with me. I was not gonna stay, and that is the reason that pushed me through that threshold, right? So it is indeed that in these cases, when the intervention is very, very good, right, I'm not gonna find this lack of correlation, no, because you actually understood the behavior. That will align more with the high risk? If you're doing a good job, then I expect you to help those high risk churners. Because right now, the intervention seems to be sort of not aimed at high risk. You get money for free. The, the thing is, when, when the high risk churners are going to be predicted as such for multiple reasons, some are going to be purely correlates of behavior, and others are going to be causes of churn. So for example, if, if the reason why you churn is because uh, the, the membership you got is as a gift, you were never interested, right? This is a pure correlation, predictive factor. And I think most of the churn models, they have a lot of just predicting factors and a lot of causes. The intervention can only fit, fix the cause, right? So the extent to which the context has mostly causes and you identify those, then they will correlate. So I'm not saying they will never correlate. I'm saying that I wanted to highlight that, uh, yeah. But it's a good observation with the type of, of treatment totally. Cool. Uh, we have another question here. Yeah, yeah I, I guess it's a follow-up in the same in the same lines. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Take this one. On um, if you think from ad development, when people, when you, I'm, think, I'm thinking about churn, like think of loyal versus non-loyal users. So if you put more ads to non-loyal users, we have seen that it's very likely that they go away more. Like and it's more likely to go away. You have a larger effect of putting more ads. Loyal people are loyal anyway, so we can put more ads to them if you wish. So it sounds very counterintuitive when the intervention is putting, giving a better experience in the app versus not a better experience. So, I mean, what, is your, what are your thoughts about it in terms of the type of intervention you tested and how that would differ with these other types of intervention? Because, because I think are counterintuitive in terms of the directions of the effects. The, um, I mean, if I understand correctly, the thing is, I'm not saying you should target people who will stay regardless. Um, because that's, that's this, if, if you would stay regardless, the, the, the lift will be zero. Because the lift would capture that, uh, that group of people with the same characteristics. So I'm not saying go to, I'm, what I'm saying is that just the metric of the risk is not enough. Yeah, yeah. So if it's, if it's a very loyal customer that is, gonna, is, has, is very satisfied with the product, whatever they're doing, an intervention won't make any difference. And I, I believe that the experimentation will put these people in the zero effect group and they shouldn't be targeted. Is it, but maybe I understand the question. Yeah, it's just I think a counterintuitive I... effect on the risk part. That, uh, in, in this particular example, the risk is actually correlated. More risk, larger effects. When you when intervention is uh, let's give them a break on ads or a better experience or some those, those flavors, that's the only point. That uh, I'm not sure if that's just particular for this. Part, I mean, your effects are just valid in this type of interventions, mm -hmm. or I mean, I'm just trying to get the commonality of those interventions versus others because I've seen cases where, uh, particularly with us, but that's not the case. Well, I guess maybe one thing to pick up on there is just this, this, this idea of, say we have some heterogeneous interventions, how much can we borrow information across those? And so uh, that kind of makes me think about, well, what, what are some of the limits of the effectiveness if uh, these aren't all uh, campaigns in the sa same category of this uh, kind of uh, public pressure, social pressure mailing? So what if we're talking about just other mailings or we have a door-to-door -door -door effort? How much uh, are we, would we really be able to borrow across there? So have you looked at that at all, or is that something you can speculate about? Yes, you know, no, that's a good question. It's like on data that I cannot share, uh, we've explored uh, exactly that. And it's like the usual thing in this game, right? If you get the architecture right, uh, you get a lot of um, gains. 
right? In a sense, we know this, right? Like just say, just 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 take it like in, in the context I have is you you have lots of different uh, interventions. Some are mailing, some are online, right? You're pooling over them all. Uh, everything I have is the, like in the, in the example I'm thinking about. Everything is still of a political nature. Uh, There's other data I have that's not of a political nature. It's more of a, a lift nature, but I can't talk about. Uh, but if you talk about like the political ones, it's sort of like you know there's a deep underlying structure, right? Like I, if I ask you 30 questions about politics, there's a very low dimensional structure uh, to your views. One or two dimensions uh, explains a, a lot if you know anything about politics. The only people that don't, I can't, one or two dimensions can't do well are the ones who don't know anything about ideology, the ones who are like, uh, they're pro-abortion, they're sorry, they're anti-choice, but they're, uh, they're anti-choice, no they're anti-choice, but they're also pro-Obamacare, right? You know, they're anti-trade, but they're strong um, foreign military uh, 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 interventionists. Those are all like things you could be logically, but that's not how the parties line up. But those are people that treatments don't really work well at all. So there are these deep underlying structures, and that's just you know, a, a, a latent thing, but that's a latent thing on the outcome, not the treatment effect, right? Not treatment effect heterogeneity. But you know, to take the example that's motivating uh, this, this paper, it's not like a crazy idea that there are people who are more open to social sanction than others. So if you had a bunch of social sanction experiments, that's gonna matter. Um, but this is like just an, this is gonna be an empirical question over a bunch of domains that you can run out of how much commonality is there uh, versus, uh, versus not. The, the thing that there's lots of active work on trying to think about this uh, and you know, this transfer learning, that might be an idea there, is like how do these kind of techniques apply uh, to these electronic medical records, right? Lots of people have been trying, it's very hard to make traction because they're very high dimensional uh, data. For any one intervention per people do, it's just not enough juice, right? So part of like, you sort of like half the bet that there's enough juice, if you, there's enough commonality that you can pull across um, them all. But the question you ask is like the, is, you know, is the core question. And, mm -hmm. and I guess still one of the questions there is if, they're, if they are very different, are you still getting gains over something that's purely unsupervised, right? Because you could do a lot of um, unsupervised representation learning that might be helpful here or supervised only by the outcome prediction task, as you suggested, without any treatment at all. Yeah, I mean, if at the end what you care about is like the, I mean, this is like, like on that question, the thing that the neural nets do that we have no other way of doing is on this last question of yours. So if you think about the conditional average treatment effect, you have three things you're observing, but you only have two pieces of information. What the thing is, you have your outcome under control, call Y0, your outcome under treatment, call that Y1, and your treatment effect, which is Y1 minus Y0. So if you think of it like a statistician, the only thing you gotta get right, the only thing that's gonna give you any juice, because asymptotic is gonna be true, are things that predict the difference. So if I have a covariate that's really good at predicting y0, of which we have tons, that's gonna as long as just drop out, it's in the constant. Mm -hmm. right? And all you're left with y1 minus y0. The thing that happens with finite data, and finite data is still there with two million observations, is that, our that if I can predict y0 well, even if that's unrelated to y1 minus y0, I have less noise in the system and I'm better at picking up the signal and the difference. And the thing that goes on with the neural net that, that you can't do with a random force, you can't do other ways, is that it's loss functions on y0 minus y1. You have another learner just doing y0 and y1. And by backpropagation, you're backpropping to your mean predictors. Your predictors are just the outcome, your eventual loss, which is on the difference. Right? And it's very hard to set that up in another kind of uh, environment. The Y learner thing that was on the slide that I didn't talk about does exactly uh, this. That they're, and it's very subtle in the sense that they're just jointly trained and they kind of like learn this dependency, right? Like, and this is very weird voodoo stuff that ends up in neural nets. If, you know, it's like, if, lots of people probably heard about GANs, right? That you have like a generative model and then you have a discriminator and they're playing a game, right? I have a generative model that's gonna generate digits, like in the NIST data set, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and I have an adversary that's trying to distinguish between the data you generate and the truth, right? The key thing about that is, if I train the generative model for say, 20 epochs, 
and then I separately generate the discriminator for 20, and I iterate that, it doesn't work. What I got to do is I got to like jointly train them. Like I do a draw for the generator, I do a draw of, of the discriminator, so like they co-evolve. And, and it's like, at a math, a ma the mathematician in me goes, that's very unsatisfying, right? Uh, as a practical matter, that happens a lot, and what's going on in this heterogeneous treatment effect is the gains are happening because they're co like in this large because they're co-evolving the the model for predicting the outcomes and controls, the model for predicting the outcome and treated, and the diff, which is what you eventually care about. And it's getting this trade-off right, even though it doesn't have the mathematical apparatus to know the asymptotic dot dot dot, and it's doing it better than if we try to write it down and plug it into a forest, which is weird, but. Yeah, let's, let's go over here. This is maybe the same way of asking the question that Dean just asked, but, or a different way of asking the, the same question. But so I'm, I'm curious, like, are, are we in this transfer learning context, are we, is the goal to learn something uh, inherent about the population, like something latent about the population that is shared across experiments? Um, and in which case, what is this method uh, offer beyond, like, if you were to just combine all your data, do PCA, and like, so, as, as Dean was saying, some unsupervised learning where you, you're, you're combining your X, your, your covariates to learn something fundamental about the, uh, you know, how, how the population is clustered. Um, how does this, would your method offer gains, uh, you know, beyond that's a great question. Forget my method. I'll give you like a theoretical answer, then I'll give you concrete. Theoretically, by the information at theory inequality, I should be able to beat your PCA, even if I stay linear, if I, if I know what my ultimate loss, what my ultimate bogey is, right? Another way of saying it, these com problems come up all the time, if someone goes, I want to know the difference between two densities, and that's what I care about, and someone goes, okay, the way I'm going to try to estimate that is I'll estimate the two densities separately and then I'll take a difference. That's not gonna, by information theory, that's not good, right? Just target directly the diff. So at a theoretical level, you better, I mean, you, there ought to be, there's, there's money being left on the table by doing it unsupervised. Um, now as a practical thing, well, A, PCA is linear, this is, this is, this is, this is mean, not linear. Potentially other methods in PCA, but yeah, yeah. just. But then, you know, if this can't be, like in our examples, it crushes any unsupervised thing, it's not even close. If it, I mean, can you come up with a bad enough architecture that can't crush it? Sure. Um, but, I mean, that would be like in the train, this is why, like, why I say like doing these at scale now, unless you have a team that's good at it, is kind of weak, that one of the things the team would build in is like, can you just, you ought to be able to do way better than those things, because you theoretically should, you should be able to um, uh, beat that. Now the question, and the other part of your question was how much of your interest is at the finding the embeddings that are universal versus just giving me a good predictor? Now this totally depends on the use case, right? The most of the problems I think about, yeah, you care about prediction, but I also really want understanding, right? And there's a whole other branch of work I'm doing that's not in this talk, it's about how do we interpret these, right? How do we, you know, how do we make them, like, it, talk to us in a theoretical way. Uh, but now, like, now you get into this big debate. Every big ML group, you know, there's a debate about this in Google Brain, there's a debate about this. And most of these places, in the Brain one, it's quite intense about people go, no, I don't need to interpret them versus I do need to interpret them. And now, you know, for me, it's like kind of depends on the, uh, on the use case. Uh, given, given legislative changes and regulatory changes that are coming, the interpretation side is gaining power. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we can take uh, an another question and one more. Okay, actually, so I, I think um, uh, we're, we're just kind of running up against our planned schedule. So um, uh, maybe if, if you have further questions, uh, chat with the speakers while you're both looking at some of the excellent posters. So um, let's give another round of applause for uh, Jasmine. <laughs> And so let me just say, uh, this more or less brings us to a wrap up. We have the poster session over there, so join that, but this is the last time we'll all be together as a group. So let me just take a minute to uh, once again not thank not only uh, these speakers, but all the speakers over the past two days and the moderators. Let's give them all a round of applause. And uh, 
although uh, Dean and, and Sinan and Sandy uh, got some of the attention, there's a lot of work, not quite a cast of thousands, but a cast of over a dozen people who uh, helped make this all possible. So uh, let me just tell you who they all were so we can give them a round of applause as well. There was Susan Young, Jovi Cohn, Carrie Reynolds, Christy Coe, Ali McDonough, uh, some students, Avi Colas, Dave Hulse, Michael Zhao, the AV team, uh, Chris McDonald and Kyle Joyce uh, on video here, Eric Speech. Let's give them all a round of applause. And uh, speaking of the video, uh, we will be making this available It'll be on our website. You'll get an email with information about how to access that sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks, maybe hopefully sooner than that. And uh, last but not least, thanks to all of you. Uh, the reason that we love this conference so much, of course, is because of the people who are here participating. Uh, thank you for coming, and we're looking forward to seeing you all next year. Thanks again.